Welcome back. You're now watching the political segment on The Weekend Show. For years now, Nigerians have been complaining about the huge cost of governance and government. This was a major talking point by one of the candidates, Peter Albi, and this was also brought up by the likes of Atiku Abubakar and President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. Just this week, we had reports about the government um, proposing to implement the Rasoya report. Now, the reason why this is important is that Guzok Jonathan in 2014 had stated that this would be um, implemented. President Muhammad Buhari had stated that this would be implemented. And now, um, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has said it should be implemented, and I think this should be done within the next 12 weeks. We have a video um, where the announcement was made and some of the ministries to be merged or scrapped. Let's watch this video and we'll have a conversation about it. Directorate, it has been scrapped. The National Senior Secondary School Education Commission is also being looked at. Um, for agencies that are required to be merged, I'll take it. Um, National Agency for Control of AIDS, HIV AIDS, NACA to be merged with the Center for Disease Control in the Federal Ministry of Health. National Emergency Management Agency to be merged with the National Commission for Refugee Migration and Internally Displaced Persons. The Directorate of Technical Cooperation in Africa to be merged with the Directorate of Technical Aid and to function as a department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Infrastructure, Concession and Regulatory Commission to be merged with Bureau for Public Enterprises. Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission to be merged with Nigerian Export Promotion Council. National Agency for Science and Technology and Science and Engineering Infrastructure to be merged with National Center for Agriculture Mechanization and the Project Development Institute. National Biotechnology Development Agency to be merged with the National Center for Genetic Resource and Biotechnology. The National Institute for Leather Science Technology to be merged with the National Institute for Chemical Technology. The Nomadic Education Commission to be merged with the National Commission for Mass Literacy, Adult Education and Non-Formal Education. The Federal Radio Corporation to be merged with the Voice of Nigeria. So you've seen um, some of the ministries to be made and some to be scrapped. One of those that caught my attention was NCC, I think, yeah. being made. Now, what I've noticed is some of these federal parastatals and MDA have higher salaries yeah. than some of the ministries. And so I don't know how that would be sorted out. And I expected this to raise some brows. Just yesterday, it was debated in the House of Reps, where they have set up um, a committee to review it, saying, oh, that report was created in 2012, and so some of it is outdated. We have, like, 100 new agencies that have been um, created. And so it will be an interesting conversation, and maybe that's the reason why we've not had this implementation over time. That, it's, it's, that's, a poss that's a high possibility, because coming all the way from uh, the good luck, Jonathan, uh, moving to... Uh uh, former President Bori and now. Uh, but my major issue is how sure are we that it will be implemented? Because they've brought it up. All the way. Always. Mm -hmm. About 12 years now. I think there's going to be a lot of kickback. But let's hear from our guests. Who's joining us? Yes, uh, joining us here in the studio, we have Honorable Kafra Kaino Boas, who is an APC chieftain and immediate past executive chairman, Kaduro Local Government of Kaduna State. Good morning, and thanks morning. for joining us. Thank you very much. So what are your thoughts on this report? Well, um, first of all, I think it's important at this moment, it's a report that sooner or later, sometime in the course of history, it was still going to be implemented uh, because, um, you know, every day the cost of governance keep rising. And then, you know, it's a, well, it's a global thing. You know, there are countries, even in Africa, Kenya, Ghana, other people have taken some drastic measures to ensure that they have enough funds to, you know, implement budget and all that infrastructural development. Uh, well, coming back to Nigeria, I think, first of all, I want to uh, salute the gods of the president to want to implement this after going through two presidents. Jonathan Goodluck had a lot of ideas, a lot of good policies, but he didn't implement some of them, most of them. In fact, you know, like the, uh, what do you call it, um, the uh, single treasury account and all that started from his tenure, but wasn't able to implement them. And then he went through Buhari, who also promised he was going to implement, and then nothing was done, the comfort report, nothing was done. But I think now 
uh, desperate times call for desperate measures. I think it's um, at the right time, you know, saying obsolete, yes, of course, but it needs to be reviewed, just like they rightly said, but I think it's coming at the right time. This is perfectly the right time to do it. You know, it's interesting that you say this, and I just remember, because you're yeah, from Cardinal State, the former governor of Cardinal State, Madame Nasser El Rufai, was one of the vocal voices that stated this should be implemented, yes. and he pushed and pushed, and we expected this to be done. So um, I'm sure this would make him have a sigh of relief or even smile that, yes, this consideration is being done. Mm -hmm. But there's this constant challenge. However, President Bonamet Tinubu has 45 ministers. He has quite a long list of special advisors. We saw what happened at COP28, yeah. where they traveled to the band, the large entourage. He's going to um, Qatar, and we've seen a list of about 38 people, and that's the list that we know of. Yeah. Does it make any real difference merging all this agency and scrapping when the executive is still running a large government with huge expenditure? Well, um, first of all, I think when you talk about um, the COP28, and then coming to the recent journey, the Qatar journey, I think you would see a big drastic change, a difference, you know. And then before then, I think he announced the cutting down of his um, aides that will be following him on foreign trips and even national trips. You know, he cut down that of his office, the office of the vice president, and also that of the wife of the president of the country and other political appointees. And then, uh, you know, moving from that figure, we took to COP28 to coming down to about 30, a little bit above 30, you know, going to Qatar. I think it's a lot of change for us. And so a lot of um, uh, cost has been reduced in that, in doing that. Uh, um, I'm a Tinibu. I think the gods he has to want to go ahead and do a lot of things, I think, uh, should be applauded. You know, when Nigerians spoke about the COP28, they complained about the number of entourage that was taken, you know, and then I think he listened. He listened and then cut down. So uh, I think the more needs to be done and more should be done. And then what we always talk about, Amin Bola Tinubu, I don't understand, like, we also need to talk about there are other MDAs and other arms of government that are also taking a lot of money from the Federation account. I'm talking about the National Assembly, the Senate and the, you know, he has, to an extent, announced his own efforts in trying to reduce the cost of governance. I think the 45 ministries is quite a lot, but we didn't envisage these problems. So maybe with the implementation of this report, maybe it might be further reviewed downwards. There's a possibility. And also political appointees, where you find out people doing also almost the same work. Like one person could manage the office of the media, and, and media, new media, and then you also have, there's an essay on electronic media, and then you also have maybe an essay on public affairs. One person could manage these three offices. So these are things the government also needs to look at at this point and see how we can um, uh, review it downwards, you know. But we should also be talking about the National Assembly. What are they giving out? The president has announced, at least he has said something about what he intends to do or what he's doing right now, as we can see with the Qatar trip. So the National Assembly should also be able to tell us as their own sacrifice to the country at this very point in time because they're taking a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Clearly you agree with the implementation of this uh, report. But um, how would this reduction, you know, in the cost of governance help the economic situation? How would it help the everyday Nigerian? Because there are lots of times that we've heard um, think they're rejigging things and they're reducing cost of things and then we do not know where the money gained from that reduction goes to because prices are still the same when I go to the Very market. I still subsidy. buy fuel over 600, almost 700 naira. So how does this reduction in the cost of governance help the everyday Nigerian and the economy at large? Okay, well, um, the merchants of the MDAs, merging, scrubbing, subsuming, and all that. I think it, it will go a long way in helping us because you'll find out that when you talk about cost of governance, it's basically talking about money expended on running government. Yeah. You know, and in that, you have the recurrent and the capital. So the recurrent is on personnel head, the personnel cost, and you know, and overhead cost also. And then the capital is on infrastructure development. And so uh, when the recurrent goes above the capital expenditure, that creates unemployment, 
because you know when there are investments, infrastructural developments, it creates jobs and all that. So it also slows down economic growth. So the capital, to a very large extent, has to always be above the recurrent because the recurrent is everyday expenditure in running government. You know, I was a local government chairman, and one thing I noticed about local governments is that they mostly, like most um, local government councils, prefer to spend money on recurrent because it's another swift way of embezzling funds. Mm. It's very easy to cover up your track, because when you talk about capital development, capital infrastructural development, it's something that's you physical. See, you yeah. can see it, and then you can access if this money was actually used for this project. So merging these infrastructure, these um, MDAs, because every ministry, department, and agency has its own overhead cost and personal running costs. So when you merge them, you see, instead of having three different costs for running these different MDAs, you merge them into one and you have one single cost for running. So to a large extent, imagine talk about monetization, car loan, or maybe not car loan, the monetization of housing and mm -hmm. cars for maybe um, MDs and DGs of agencies. When you merge them, they have one MD or DG or one minister mm -hmm. they work under. So those costs of cars, housing, may be taken off, may be scrapped in that, in that, in that way. Yeah. And then these monies can be used to implement the budget. When you inject this money to the budget, the layman on the streets will be able to see physically. But also, before, let me, let me not skip. One important thing we always talk about is we need to change our attitude as Nigerians. Everybody sits and says the economy is bad, is the present, is the present. Like I said, let's also look into the House of National Assembly. And then let's come down, look into other things. Like you were talking about price, I watched you before I came on board, price in the market. I was in a store, we were trying to buy some things, and right there, the owner of the store received a call, and then prices have gone up. And immediately, he increased the price of goods he had before, prior to that time. You see, Nigerians sometimes we want to take advantage of things, and then we make the economy uh, very, very hard for ourselves. And we come to complain, always looking up to the president. I understand there's a lot of tax, and he wanted the job, so he has to execute. But what can we do as Nigerians to help him soften these things? Because we're all in it. Even the APC people, everybody's involved. So how do we do? What is our own contribution to this? You know? So we need to change our attitude when it comes to this. I think this is the right time that churches, all the tithes and offerings that have been collected, they need to come now and look at the people. Whatever funds we have saved should be spent on the people. You know, churches, mocks, now it's time to give back to the society. Um, Argentina and other countries have also done that. You know, the new president, when he came, he was sworn in. He decided to cut down political appointees. Like I said, even Kenya, Ghana, Rwanda, they've all done that. And now they have more money to inject into implementing the budget, thereby providing jobs for the people. So these are things we need to do. Look at now, it's time to give back. Yeah, I appreciate everything um, you've said, particularly the economic um, explanations that you've given. But where does accountability come in? in the place of the National Assembly, like you said? Well, um, one thing I always want to propose, like uh, I think India has done, is um, automating the governance, automating governance. You know, the introduction of e-governance. It's one thing, like you mentioned, Marlon Asio Erofai, he has done a lot of that during his tenure. You know, he, he tried to ensure that there is the, um, what do you call it, e-governance introduced in Kaduna State. I, as a local government chairman, I've tried to see that we start using meals. I created um, a kind of um, in-house mailbox whereby we can exchange meals, you know, documents. Uh, you find out that sometimes you're looking for a file, it's missing just because someone has an interest and all that. So when you automate e-governance, we, you know, it becomes very easy to track whatever is happening. Instead of carrying papers around, I think we need to introduce e-accounting and e-auditing, whereby anybody within the system can view what is transactions and what government is doing with uh, uh, resources. So talking about what you're saying, once that is introduced, we'll be able to have a real view, real-time view of what is happening, where money go to and where this money are, expenditures are, are, you know, are affected. And it becomes very easy to track these things. National Assembly, once this is done, we will be able to check. And then there should be a proper you know, check and balances in government. This is what e-governance and e-auditing brings to the table. And it's a, one of the perfect way of reducing costs in government, just like India did, and it's working for them. And even Argentina right now, you know, within, from December to this very time, you've heard about the turnover 
It's one of the, the economy is getting better. Economy that have suffered for about 20 years, it's now getting better within a very short period of time. And then there's so much projection uh, in the near future that it thinks are going to be better than he meant it. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to you because you've made some very vital points. But I understand we have. A yeah, we have a guest, guest joining us on Zoom. Um, Olarunwaju Suraju, who is the Chairman, Human and Environmental Development Agenda. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. Okay. So, do you want to share your thoughts about the proposed plan to implement the RSYA um, report, um, which has been announced mm -hmm. by this administration? Oh, thank you very much. Um, I, I think um, it is important for us to appreciate uh, every attempt at actually reducing the cost of government, not, not because necessarily we don't believe that uh, governance really costs money uh, and then there will be uh, um, so much investment uh, for the system to enjoy any form of effective and efficient service delivery on the part of the public service. But uh, it is important um, at the same time to realize that, that we've actually run very bogus um, machineries of government uh, in this country, uh, not entirely just to the uh, fault of uh, government in some instance, but is also part of the mentality of quite a number of we Nigerians that um, uh, we're actually not training uh, the system or the young people to actually become the employers of labor, but rather everybody wants to actually be employee and then also get uh, and live on salaries. Uh, uh, that is on one side. Uh, the other side is the fact that politicians are also in the penchant of wanting to actually get um, the appointment, not based on merit many times, but also on patriotic, I mean, sorry, uh, patronage and at the same time nepotism to see how we make sure that uh, we populate the civil service and even create uh, additional offices for uh, uh, the um, attempt to absorb those that we think should be sharing part of the loot. And as much as this is also interesting and important, I, I think it would be uh, very, very strategic uh, that it is not only with the civil service and the uh, institutions that are also being matched. There are some of them that are completely unnecessary to be matched, but it is important to have a very holistic look at the implementation process. No doubt, we have new ministries that have emerged post the Orosanye report. So uh, we have the uh, new agencies, departments that were subsequently created after Orosanye report. So it's important to see how if those um, separate agencies and ministries are also still relevant and needed. And in the absence of that, uh, there's a need to actually match them. But what is also for me very uh, critical is the uh, appointment of um, AIDS by not just at the federal level, but also at the state level. I mean, how do you in any way justify uh, governors appointing thousands of special assistants uh, in states that are not even able to boast of 10 million, even 5 million population? I, I think it is really uh, out of the world to see how our politicians think and how they also perceive public funds. So. Um, uh, th these are the mentalities that needs to change. If, if the mentality does not change, uh, believe me, even if we merge the agencies now, uh, the, our politicians have the propensity for also creating an alternative uh, route for actually mismanaging the public funds. Talking about mismanaging public funds, this is a concern which I personally have, um, and a lot of Nigerians will say, we were told for subsidy had to be removed, but the question is, where is that money going to? Now, even with these uh, modifications which are being proposed, you already have a lot of people who have been appointed as MDs and DGs of Parastatals that are now listed to be merged. You already have um, the budget which has been appropriated to those agencies and organizations. Now, isn't this just going to create a way where you say you're cutting cost of governance, but this money still goes back to the politicians and government officials when this has already been appropriated for certain reasons and for those um, um, organizations? And I say this because we've seen a lot of knee-jerk reaction by this government. The president was sworn in on that day. He stated that um, four subsidies are removed. 
A couple of months later, or um, quite not long after that, we heard that the Naira was being floated. And now all of what we are doing is paying the price for those knee-jerk reactions. Now, we've heard that some of this should be done within the next 12 weeks. Do you think that with the process and the way this has been announced, it wouldn't even lead to more wastage or lack of accountability? No, I, I think I completely agree with you uh, that the implementation of some of those policies, I, I think this government really didn't have a full grasp of, of what are the potential spiral implications of not just pronouncements, uh, not just policies, but also even uh, activities of the government. And we would always talk about, uh, even under the previous government, that the body language uh, um, was meant to do something under uh, uh, Buhari before the bo body language then became body odor, uh, according to what people would want to also perceive the failure of, of those um, actions or pronouncements to have the impact. Uh, it, it was extremely wrong uh, for the president to have just made that pronouncement, considering the nature of what Nigerians are. It, it is not just only... Uh, with government. And I think this is very, very critical uh, because we don't really have the monitoring mechanisms that are effective to ensure compliance and enforcement of both government programs, policies, both in the public and also the private life. As at the time the president made the pronouncement, there was no basis for the fuel stations and fuel marketers to immediately, you know, just jack up the prices of uh, pump, uh, pump price of, of petroleum product. It was just not done anywhere. Uh, but this can actually happen and you get away with it in Nigeria because even the ones who have the fuel at the earlier subsidized rate, they will decide to immediately, like what happened, decided immediately just jack up the price and everything just started going north. Uh, and the same thing with the floating of the Naira. How do you also, without telling about the consequences and the implications, uh, and uh, and then you just say we are going to float the data. And the thing went also the other way around. So you would then have to start rushing to cash it up. So uh, there's no doubt that what has been caught from the subsidy uh, is gone to the governors. Uh, and this we also need to actually hold those, the, our um, state governors uh, also uh, to account. The, the state governors are having almost like few days. And I will tell you this, uh, and unfortunately, is the reality and the truth. I was part of some of the investigations uh, that were actually done by EFCC at some point around the issue of money laundering, and then also the, the sad and appalling falling uh, rate of uh, the Naira. And it was discovered that the Naira falls rapidly any time that the FAC allocation is done. And that is when the money goes to the local government and the state governments. A majority of these state governors don't even keep that money uh, that comes from... It is that bad because we don't have state houses of assembly. The money once they collect, it goes to the Buru de Change where they convert it to dollar. And they also hold these dollars in God knows where they warehouse it, in government houses. And that was what you saw uh, with the case that was also going on with Kogi State, where it was revealed how um, allocation... As, as, that gets into the state is done between the governor, his cousin, and whatever. With Burundi change in Abuja, converted to dollars and used for whatever. This is an, a typical example of the majority of state governors that we have. Now that the subsidy was removed, the whole allocation and uh, the deduction from federal allocation is gone down. So the state and local government are getting more. But we don't see the state and government, local governments doing anything. Nothing has changed uh, technically in many of the states. So let us also ensure that we don't just focus on federal government. This is actually a federalism we're practicing. And we have the responsibilities that we have with the states, the federal, and also the local government. All the primary health, primary education, our markets, garages, and, uh, and the rest of that are completely just comatose. And these are the direct responsibilities of the state government. If you can have those working, I mean, where does the federal government have land for farming, uh, except for possibly in Abuja? The state governments are the ones with the, with, the, with the lands where they can do farming. The state governments are where they're supposed to provide water 
uh, for the for the states and their cities. It doesn't happen. I, I don't know if you have states that you want to use as examples where you have uh, high level mechanized farming, except for where you would see them distributing generators. Uh, digging just bowls instead of providing, you know, um, pipeline water for the mass of the citizens. So this is where we really have the problem. Uh, but the leadership needs to be shown, and I completely also will agree that there must be a need for the leadership to be shown. That is why the money goes to the state from the federal government. The governors have a duty also to be held to the account, not just by the citizens, but also the federal government. I mean, it's, it's a federation, no doubt, but we have, and the law, the, the Supreme Court already decided that the anti-corruption agencies have jurisdiction over the states. So there must be further scrutiny, and the president cannot afford to also do it uh, like a family or party affairs when some of the governors are actually also fingered. Unfortunately, it is extremely difficult for the law and the corruption agencies uh, to do beyond what the government, the president would want to have. Uh, on the, otherwise, we wouldn't have some of those that you have uh, leading the country in office, uh, considering their background uh, when they were in office as governors. Uh, the, the minister, the current minister of FCT was indicted uh, as the governor uh, in, in, uh, in River State. The Senate president was also indicted in a quiet bomb. So it is extremely going to be tough, uh, really getting accountability uh, and, uh, and, and then also holding people to account if this level of impunity is allowed. Mm. <clears throat> You've emphasized a lot on the state gov governors and state governance and cost uh, there in the various states. Uh, but I would like to know, do you think there could be any potential drawbacks to this implementation uh, by the president, seeing as with all you've said now, there are lots of benefits to this um, high cost in governance to the state government. So do you think there could be potential drawbacks from these uh, governors or even members of the Senate and the reps in implementing this report? Definitely, this is what you've, you've been seeing. I mean, you can see, uh, unfortunately, there are an attempt by the uh, Senate president to also mention some of those um, uh, uh, allocations that went to the governors that, and, and there was no impact. I, I, I saw him also trying to eat his words by because one or two of the governors uh, attempted to also attack him. And uh, that, that is what you see with politicians uh, and the political elites. They always have a means of immediately reconciling uh, the differences, uh, what you can consider to be the differences, uh, but not anytime in the interest of the public or, or even the citizens. So um, we, it's, it's already biting, and I'm sure that was why the federal government or the president or the Senate president were forced to actually also speak out because it's already becoming increasingly clear that attempts at cautioning the effect of the uh, subsidy removal, uh, which was thought that could also be uh, engineered and implemented through the state mechanisms, were complete failure. Uh, there was also the uh, recent allocation that was also revealed by uh, Mr. Femi Fala and OSCN about what was also shared amongst them uh, from the uh, COVID-19 you know, loan that we obtained from the World Bank. Uh, and all this, that was also running to about three billion uh, per state government. Go check if you have any medical facility, public medical facilities in any of the states uh, that you can boast of even impacting uh, with about 100 million. Uh, and you won't find any, you know, um, in majority of the states. So uh, the, 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 the backlash and also the drawback from this is the fact that we still don't have that very strong accountability mechanisms in the states. We don't have the oversight functions in the states. Uh, the local government has already been emasculated by the governors. You, you don't really see, I mean, the governors who don't even organize election in, in many of the states and appoint their own persons to just supervise. The NFIU made an attempt at also reducing their influence and withdrawals from the state, and they fought it as, at it, as it is today they actually overcame that um, attempt to, to reduce the level of the influence of governors. So you don't have functional local governments in, in many of the states. Uh, and all that they do is just through the governor. So you have just governor who is in charge of the state, strict or sensible, no state 
uh, House of Assembly with any power to raise questions. The moment they, that is done, the speaker is removed uh, and the head is just decapitated. There's no local government. See what happened with the local government chairman in Ogun State, who actually came out and said, look, these governors are just actually not only spending our allocation, even accumulating debt on our behalf with our knowledge. He was not only removed from our office, he was hounded, he was even prosecuted by the police and eventually removed from office. That is the kind of authoritarian regime that you have in many of the states. Thank you um, so much. Just before um, I let you go and we also come back and wrap up in the studio, I, and first of all, just to protect my team, I would like to state that all the opinions are the opinions of the guests and not necessarily the weekend show or AIT, just because we can't pay fines. But I personally feel that this may not be the best solution, especially because when we talk about huge cost of governance, like the Honourable in the studio rightly said, let's look at the National Assembly. You see close to 20 billion being allocated for a National Assembly hospital. You see billions being allocated for an Aso Villa hospital every year. These people don't get treatment in Nigeria, they travel out of the country. Now, we have an unemployment problem. Even though they've modified the metrics for gauging unemployment in Nigeria from um, weekly to hourly, we now have a system where the Deputy Speaker of the House of Reps was on TV just this week complaining that the money they are being paid is not even enough for them. But we have a lot of money being allocated to things that don't affect or help the masses. By scrapping some of these ministries and some of these measures, the reason why you have some of the MDAs is because some of the ministries are not functional and all they do is push papers. So you see the likes of Peter that have recorded huge success in what they are doing. You see the likes of Naseni that is um, gaining um, grounds with what they are doing. When you now want to merge or scrap some of this, isn't this going to increase unemployment and reduce um, efficiency? And shouldn't we be speaking more to the National Assembly about the wastages and leakages within the National Assembly and in the budget process, which has been known to be padded over the years? What's the way forward with this? No, um, I completely agree to uh, a very large extent on what you have with the, um, the budget with the National Assembly. I mean, that is really uh, obscene uh, to see how the National Assembly, without any level of uh, procurement transparency uh, that the public can uh, actually access, and, and then also... Uh, no form of accountability that you can also credit to uh, the system. Uh, jacking up his own budget, you know, um, the moment it gets into the... And the irony of it, and the most unfortunate, and you can go and check, I mean, uh, quite a number of civil society organizations have um, monitored the constituency project of the National Assembly. It's always been a very big scam. Uh, that you have this constituency project uh, that are implemented, which is actually illegal, and it's also even unconstitutional. The parliament does not have any constitutional power to be involved with the execution of projects. That is purely uh, the responsibilities of the, um, the executive arm of government. But unfortunately, like I said, the politicians who are always looking for one way or the other to rob my back so that they rob their, my back so that I rob your back. Um, started that under the Obasanjo regime to placate the National Assembly uh, for the selfish purpose by, by allocating funds to uh, the, um, uh, the constituency project. So that would really need to go inevitably. Uh, I don't completely agree that you would have to, you must have this multiplicity of agencies and, and, and governments. I mean, and uh, and ministries. We, we don't really need to have them when you want to. So if you're talking about the e-governance system that you are talking about, then it will reduce that number. So we need to reduce that number and have us move to more digital. Uh, and you, you can imagine the overbloating of, of the uh, the wages profile of the government where you always hear about, you know, ghost workers. I mean, those are things that are also consuming, and this is on a monthly basis. It is not a one-off thing. So it is, these are things that really need to be scrutinized. We need to have a very clean uh, um, sheet on, on the real uh, capacity of the uh, civil service that we run, not only just at the federal, but at the same time 
also at the level and at the state level. And I've seen and observed how um, state governors and even at the federal level can actually subvert the uh, mandate of many of the ministries by even having agencies that are more powerful uh, than the ministries, uh, that the head of the agencies are not even accountable or responsible to the ministers, but rather uh, to the chief of staff, to the president, or even directly to the president. That is not how it works. I mean, if you look at the whole of what you hear about FBI, about CIA, about some of those other agencies, it's just under the, uh, the Department of, uh, of Justice in the U.S. So you can have just that department or that ministry that supervises quite a number of other agencies with a measure of uh, that money. So some of those ones that you're talking about, Peter and the rest, so they can start actually function without necessarily being uh, the you know um, separately independent with so much uh, unnecessary and undue bureaucracy uh, that that are so associated and over bloated also um, uh, um, personnel uh, for for them to function. So we must be able to look holistically at all the issues. Uh, and look at the ones that you will agree with, the ones that I will agree with, and then we can always come to a common ground to make sure that we reduce the cost of governance, not only at the civil service level, but also at the political level as well. Thank you so much for your contributions. We will be uh, monitoring the situation and hopefully once and if there's implementation, we'll bring you back to have this conversation. But thank you so much for your contribution. We'll return to the... Thank you. Have a nice weekend. We'll return to the studio to wrap up with um, our Honourable. Yeah, so Honourable, uh, looking ahead, after all has been said, what do you envision as the key priorities for uh, Nigeria's economic uh, recovery and sustainable growth at large? Well, um, there are some things I've thought about and, and I think, uh, first of all, let me start by saying from experience on what I know and what I've seen as a policy analyst, analyst and then also economics. I think if as long as we don't make a deliberate effort, an intentional effort, to build the local government, I think we might just be going in cycles. We might just be going in cycles. I was in NIPS, and one of the things I've thought about, and I think I advise them that we should do, is try to, you know, we talked about, uh, we've been talking about autonomy, 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 and it's not working because of the kind of powers the governors have. What other way do we go about this? That's why when people talk about the president, you know, you were talking, he even brought up some points that I liked about um, people jacking off price by the mere pronouncement of the president. Yeah. The president didn't, didn't um, create, didn't, I, I don't blame him for, you know, the first subsidy and all that because Argentina has done that. There are so many countries that have taken out subsidies, not just in the oil sector, uh, infrastructure, uh, the transport, and even electricity and all that just to have enough money to implement the budget and then push money into the, um, to the economy. So, but I think as long as we need to create a kind of um, a commission agency or whatever we can call it, that empowers the local government and removes them from the powers of the governors. Because I think that is the grassroots. Who are those people complaining in the society about hardship, about hunger? There are people in different you know, villages, communities, and the local government. So as long as we, every local government has one or another potential, it's something in research I've been working on, I'm still on it, they have one or another potential. What can we do about these potentials? What can we do about this um, activity they have that can generate resources for the local government? It's time to start building resources from the grassroots and not wait for the federal government to always bring money. But then, uh, like we rightly said, uh, looking into the National Assembly also, what sacrifices are they giving? What are they willing to offer for the nation? I think most of our problem in Nigeria is about patriotism. Patriotism. Because the president making that pronouncement about subsidy removal is gone under me. And you know, some people just ran and took advantage. That's what I'm saying. We always look at the president. We always blame the president. We have where we need to contribute also to a better economy. They went ahead, jack of prizes, and then before you know, everything went haywire. So let's start looking at them. And then, like I said, I must emphasize on e-governance, e-accounting and e-auditing. It removes that power from one single individual who calls himself the chief auditor to come and do whatever he wants to do. I don't want to go deep into this system because I've seen them. I know how this system operates. 
But when it becomes when it becomes electronic, you know, it gives a better a better view, a better uh, what do you call it publicity to the general public, so that uh, civil societies can also criticize. Okay, they need this information. Yeah. Transparent governance. That's what I'm talking about. Honorable, thank you so much for your contributions. And I do agree with you. Um, I admire Kaduna State when I see how they empower young and brilliant people. So it's always refreshing. But a very vital point is we need to hold our state governors and state governments accountable. Mm -hmm. Most state governors have refused to have a ministry for local government and chieftaincy affairs, so they will put a special advisor who reports to them and there's no accountability. Most of the hardship and poverty where everyone focuses on the president and Abuja, you need to hold your local government chairman, your state governors accountable, your state house of assembly, because they have a role to play. But finally, we need to decentralize government. There's too much power in Abuja, the federal government, which is why the government is also the punching bag at the federal level. State governments should be given power so that they should be held accountable and be transparent. And finally, e-governance, transparency and accountability is extremely important.